sir we may proceed uh, just two minutes and then we proceed okay sir no issues after two minutes you proceed please I think we can proceed now. Unanji? Sure, sir. A very marvelous and charming good morning and a very warm and extended welcome to our distinguished speaker of the day, Professor Rajaram Nityanand, our EC members, all the participants who have attended this virtually. I, Poonam Jain, member of Executive Council, IAPT, RC1. Welcome you all for the second vibrant lecture series organized by Indian Association of Physics Teachers Regional Council 1. The title for today's lecture is Revisiting the Laws of Thermodynamics. Hopefully, you all will relish each and every moment of this lecture. Before beginning with the formal session of the day, this is to inform you all that this session is being recorded and streaming live on YouTube and Facebook. Participants are requested to post their queries related to the lecture in the chat box, which will be taken up at the end of the lecture. Also, I request all the participants to mute their mics during the session for the smooth conduct of the event. Without further ado, I request Dr. M.S. Bhandari, the Secretary Indian Association of Physics Teachers, Regional Council 1, to welcome our distinguished guest and give introduction about IAPT, specifically IAPT RC1 and its activity. Over to you, Bhandari, sir. Thank you, Poonamji. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Indian Association of Physics Teacher, a major and well-reputed organization established by late Dr. D. P. Khandelwal in year 1984 has various lo local chapters in different states. IAPT RC1 is the local chapter for Delhi and Haryana. We organize various activities for promotion of physics and physics education. Today's lecture is a part of this mission. Here is another proud moment for us to have an opportunity to welcome our distinguished speaker, Professor Radharam Nityanandji. Last year also, you gave your blessings in the form of very intuitive and informative lectures. Uh, we all are greatly uh, uh, grateful for that. A showcase of various activities IAPT RC1 organizes every year is Ved Ratna Memorial Lecture. In this program, eminent scientists from physics fraternity come and grace the occasion every year. IAPT holds regional competition on innovative experiments in physics. Organization holds training workshops on hands-on approach of teaching physics. At the central level, IAPT organizes various examinations of international repute. Some of them are National Standard Examination in Junior Science, 
popularly known as NSEJS. This examination leads to International Olympiad in Junior Science. National Standard Examination in Physics, Chemistry, Bio, and Astronomy, popularly known as NSEP, NSEC, NSEB, and NSEA. National Graduate Examination, NGPC. And many more activities are organized by IAPT. This year also due to Corona pandemic, IAPT RC1 is holding a series of lectures on webinar. Today's lecture is the first in the series. With this, on behalf of IAPT RC1, I would like to welcome all the past executive members of IAPT RC1, executive members of Delhi State Science Teachers Forum, physics teachers of NCRT, physics teachers from Delhi University, teachers from different institutions, nation and abroad. Participation of physics fraternity in large number is uh, gratifying and motivating for us. A warm welcome to all of you. यहाँ पर एक बहुत छोटी सी बात में अपनी तरफ से अपनी भाषा में ऐड करना चाहूंगा I think there is a problem in the uh, network. Sir is on mute right now. Bandari, sir. Shivaswa, sir, we may proceed. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sir. Sorry, because of the network issue, Bandari, hello, sir, is. Hello. कोई हमें कुछ देगा सेल्फलेस होता था सारा का सारा तो आज अः नित्यानंद जी जो हमारे गुरु है हमारे से श्रेष्ठ है आदरणीय है Uh, उनकी जो ये भावना है जिस तरह से वो हमारे साथ जुड़े और अपना टाइम निकाला तो मुझे इस बात की तरफ इशारा करता है कि आज हम दान ग्रहण कर रहे हैं और ये भी उनकी महानता है क्योंकि ये भी कहा गया है कि दान किसको दिया जा रहा है ये भी देखना है हम किसी को भी दान नहीं दे सकते तो उन्होंने हमें इस योग्य समझा इसके लिए भी हम उनके आभारी हैं एंड विद दिस आई वेलकम अवर रिस्पेक्टेड सर नित्यानंद जी थैंक यू सर Unam ji thank you so much sir now uh, thank you sir for introducing iapt to all the new participants and the participants who used to join our session from the last year in the online mode now i would like to request professor vp shrivastav president indian association of physics teachers regional council 1 to introduce our distinguished speaker of the day over to you sir namaskar good morning everyone it's my pleasure and honor to introduce today's speaker professor nityanand an outstanding physicist and an amazing lecturer professor rajaram nityanand did msc in physics from indian institute of technology madras and phd from bangalore university working at the material science division of the national aeronautical now aerospace laboratory bangalore on optics and crystallography he was a professor at the raman research institute before taking up the position of a center director national center for radio astrophysics pune a center of tata institute of fundamental research which he held till 2010 he then served as a center director tifr center for interdisciplinary sciences hyderabad from march 2011 to june 2012 from march 2013 to january 2014 
He was a visiting professor at Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Aizer Pune, and he currently works as a professor in the School of Liberal Studies, Ajim Premji University, Bengaluru. Professor Nityanand has research interest in solid state physics, liquid crystals, astronomical optics, image processing, and gravitational dynamics. He has been a reader of Pramana, Journal of Physics, and Journal of Astrophysics and Astronomy, and the editor of Resonance, a Journal of Science Education. He was a member of the International Steering Committee of the Australian Telescope National Facility. He was also the chairman, Board of Governors, NIT, Trishurapalli. Professor Nityanan served as the Physical Sciences Jury for the Infosys Prize from 2015 to 2017. Professor Nityanan is a fellow of all the three National Science Academies of India, namely, is a fellow of the Indian National Science Academy, fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, and also the fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences. Professor Nityanan received the K.S. Krishnan Memorial Lecture Award in 2004 of INSA. His extended visits abroad were to Department of Astrophysical Sciences, Princeton University in 1983, Institute of Theoretical Physics, University of California, Santa Barbara, and Institute of Astronomy, Cambridge in 1987, Canadian Institute of Theoretical Astrophysics in 1994 and 2009, and Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics in 1998. Last year, Professor Nitanan gave two lectures on wave optics during our series. These lectures and other lectures are also available on YouTube channel of IPTRC1. This, it is over to Professor Nitanan. Thank you, uh, Professor Srivastava, Professor Bhandari, Professor Poonam Jain. Um, it's very nice to be back with this enthusiastic group of uh, teachers of physics, and I'm sure uh, lovers of physics, which I can see that from. And I also want to say, I, I don't think I'm doing anyone a favor uh, when you... Uh, you know, prepare a lecture like this, it's a chance to think, think through everything again. And I think uh, you also would have had the same experience that by teaching physics, you also improve your own physics. Um, as was pointed out, uh, thermodynamics is, uh, can I share screen? Yes. Okay. Sure, sir. Ah, so. Yeah. So, Thermodynamics is uh, one of the very widely applicable, important, but also uh, uh, somewhat challenging to uh, understand for oneself and to teach. So uh, when I talked last time, I couldn't have showed you this picture, but now our university has built its uh, permanent campus. Okay. So I just thought I'll show you a picture of that. And uh, unfortunately, it couldn't be fully occupied because of the pandemic, but I'm sure it will be a flourishing campus. Now, uh, what do we mean by thermodynamics? The uh, well, screen is not visible. Ah, okay, okay. Then I think I encountered this problem last time also, right? I, I, okay. Yes, sir. But... Let me let me let me try again. Share. Sure, now it's visible, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ah, but the moment I go to slideshow, let me go to slideshow and first slide. Yes, sir. Yeah. Still visible? Yes, sir. Perfect. Okay, good, good. good. Right. Now, our physics curriculum uh, usually begins with mechanics and electricity and magnetism. In some sense, they are simpler than uh, thermodynamics. Uh, they are fundamental also. You deal with fundamental laws and uh, maybe systems of few particles, you know, colliding with each other, orbiting around each other. Maybe they are charged particles. Maybe they are in magnetic fields. But these are relatively simple systems with a small number of particles. And one makes very detailed predictions. From it. You can say exactly what is happening in the solar system or in an atom. Now, uh, thermodynamics is very different. Its scope is uh, energy and matter in all its forms. And, uh, you know, uh, when having such a broad scope, it obviously cannot go into such detail. So I will be using this analogy that uh, it deals with all of nature, 
but it deals with nature in the same way the accountants deal with the economy now accountants uh, keep track of various things important things but they don't actually they don't actually participate in the economy in the sense of going and producing something or consuming something at least not as accountants okay uh, i've already said it's very widely applicable right and interestingly uh, why does it work uh, from the point of view of mechanics or electromagnetism if you give a large number of particles they you can still solve the problem but the equations get very complicated and this used to be a problem it's becoming less of a problem because with very powerful computers you can actually you know do thousands of particles right so some of the systems we talk about in thermodynamics uh, like say a gas in a box you cannot do an avogadro's number of particles but you could do thousands of particles and it would work but interestingly uh, we don't need that to make uh, various statements about how the gas behaves or how even a solid behaves uh, you don't need to follow all the particles so clearly uh, thermodynamics uh, is applicable to many of the systems we see because they have a large number of particles and we are seeing some kind of average behavior okay so I, that's enough for a general definition right and even now that we have the computers if you can make statements below these powerful computers why not right so that's the spirit of thermodynamics so in fact it was founded long before people uh, had even uh, maxwell's equations uh, or the modern way of doing mechanics certainly long before computers <laughs> uh, being from karnataka naturally i have to show you something very nice in karnataka which is jog falls so your reaction seeing this would probably be you know oh, what a beautiful place maybe one should go there and uh, and as a physicist you might say okay uh, whatever is coming out of the top has some kinetic energy but then as it falls if you neglect air resistance that's converted into a potential energy right and then it reaches the bottom hmm? now uh, it's interesting to look at the reaction of uh, one of the great engineers of karnataka very early in the 20th century a nice picture of him usually the pictures are very old but he found this one and what did he say when he saw these falls he said what a waste now what did he mean by that now you know very often a lay layman says you know we have to conserve energy and I tell them no we don't have to conserve energy the laws of physics guarantee the conservation of energy okay. but clearly uh, what visheshwarya had in mind is that the energy is not so useful when it comes down it's taken a different form okay so if you look historically at the first law uh, it really came in the early 19th century to rescue the law of conservation of energy in a situation like jog falls at the end when the water settles down at the bottom you have lost the kinetic energy and you have lost the potential energy so uh, to make the books balance as accountants either you have to say we have lost the energy or you can look very carefully at that water and put a thermometer in it and then you'll see its temperature is increased slightly right so you say okay this water has an internal energy which depends on the temperature right and uh, this has been converted to internal energy i'm using the word internal energy because we'll use the word heat for something else okay so uh, of course if you go on inventing new fictitious forms of energy you can make any law of conservation work right but that's not the point the point is internal energy is something that we can keep track of once one has made measurements of uh, thermal capacity or if the material changes state then you have to measure latent heat you can account properly for the internal energy and therefore actually uh, check uh, and this is what we do in calorimetric experiments right but there's more to the uh, first law than uh, just the inclusion of heat energy uh, conservation laws by themselves are not useful suppose i tell you the total energy in the uh, universe is uh, conserved and then you look at your box and suddenly some energy disappears from the box then you say look energy is not conserved and i say no it has gone you know to the moon now that's not useful right so what do you mean by local conservation is uh, you are always dealing with a uh, part of the whole system never the whole system so either the energy in that is conserved or if the energy changes you can actually explain that change by some inflow or outflow of energy okay so a local conservation law is useful it has some predictive power 
But to give that predictive power, we have to understand uh, transfer of energy from this body to other bodies, right? Now, one form of transfer energy is very well known in mechanics. You have one object, it exerts a force on another object, and there's some displacement in the direction of that force. It does some work. So work is a form of transfer. And uh, uh, if A does some work on B, the energy of B increases and the energy of A decreases if the sign of the work is positive, okay? Uh, but there are situations where you do work, uh, right? So this, what I just told you is called the work energy theorem, right? That the change in energy of a system can be accounted for by the work done on it. However, in thermodynamics, we also include another form of transfer. So if I uh, put a Bunsen burner below my you know, vessel of uh, some liquid, it's not, the Bunsen burner doesn't seem to be uh, a force uh, displacing this, right? Nevertheless, we know heat gets transferred. So heat is a mode of transfer. Uh, let's just call it hidden work in the present moment. Huh? Now, uh, one should worry a little bit about this because the work energy theorem of mechanics is sacred. Right? Um, so let me uh, uh, give you a quick answer to this question. If you were able to use a microscope and look at the bottom of the uh, uh, vessel which you're heating with and look at all the molecules in the Bunsen burner, you would actually see collisions taking place. The energetic molecules from the Bunsen burner would be hitting the less energetic molecules and they would be transferring energy. So at a microscopic level, the work energy theorem is correct. However, uh, so when you talk of work in thermodynamics, you're talking of the average force and average displacement. And of course, there is a hidden work, which is all kinds of hidden forces and hidden displacements, right? The molecules moving up and down and so on. And that we call heat, heat transfer. Okay. So uh, I made this distinction that internal energy is a property of the system. It's like a bank account balance, okay? Uh, now that balance can change. It can, it can change by many methods. So what I just explained to you is that one way it can change is called W, uh, macroscopic force displacing which are kind of visible to you. And uh, if something is happening on a microscopic scale, uh, we call that Q, and that is a transaction, uh, energy uh, going from one system to another. But uh, I would liken the first one to cash, because you can see it. The person comes with a suitcase to the bank and you know, hands it over. <laughs> but uh, the other one is like internet banking. It just happens it's in this okay? So it's important to say that uh, U is a property of the system and can be brought about in many ways. In fact, the experiments which we teach by uh, Julie, uh, what did he do? He took this water and then he inserted some wooden paddles and he rotated them. And uh, to rotate it, the weight fell down. So the potential energy of the weight decreased and he measured the temperature change. Uh, and he was able to uh, change the internal energy. By the way, this is a very difficult experiment. Don't try it. And the reason is very simple. <laughs> if you take Job Falls, there's a huge amount of potential energy. Uh, I didn't tell you the actual amount of uh, heat which occurs. But if you work it out, you'll find it's uh, three quarters of a degree. Okay? Very small. But Julie was able to measure it. But even before that, he used another form of uh, work, namely a voltage driving a current you know, where charges move from a higher potential to a lower potential. And there, with a the heater, you can very easily uh, transfer heat. So that all that we'll classify as W. Or you can put a Bunsen burner and do Q. Okay. Now, uh, it's important, and I, I am repeating this because there could be a certain amount of confusion here. So internal energy is the property of the system. Like you have so much money in the bank. Now, how you got it is a different matter. And there could be many ways you could have got it. So a very formal way of stating this is that uh, internal energy is a state function. If you look at the system now, don't worry about how it got there. You can still say what is its internal energy. But I cannot say how much work was done or how much heat was transferred unless I kept track of the entire history of the system, the path. Okay. So I thought, you know, sometimes uh, our lectures do not have to be extremely formal, right? We can give analogies. So even at an undergraduate level, I, I find 
cannot go on just writing equations, right? So uh, I'll give you an analogy. The distinction between uh, state functions and uh, uh, path functions. Let's think of a mountain which is being climbed. We have two climbers, and each climber carries uh, two meters. One is called an altimeter, yeah, which measures your altitude. Actually, it measures the pressure of air. Yeah. That's how the altimeter works. So the person takes the reading at the bottom and the reading at the top. Now, nowadays, uh, many of you may already be carrying something called a pedometer, or even your mobile phone may have it, right? And that measures the number of steps you have taken. So uh, they look at the uh, altimeter and pedometer at the beginning of the journey. Uh, they're together. They take different routes. They climb the mountain. And then they look at the readings at the end. Okay. So in this figure, uh, yeah, the white line is the mountain, dashed line. Uh, the blue line is one of the people, and the other one is the other people. And I think anyone with common sense will say that the altimeter will just show the difference in height uh, above sea level, let us say, from here to here. So that's like internal energy U. Uh, it's a state function. You don't need to know how we got there. But if you want to know the reading on the speedometer, you know, obviously this blue mountaineer is either, you know, very conservative or, uh, you know, very... Uh, wants to keep safe, takes a very nice route, and the other mountaineer, you know, climbs some very steep things and moves around. So their readings are definitely going to be different. So the distinction between uh, state functions and path functions uh, can be made. Uh, and if you want to make it even more mathematically, which I will not do in this lecture, uh, you first of all write it for a small amount, and you du is an exact differential. So you can integrate it, and the answer will be u2 minus u1. Unfortunately, we use the same notation dq, but the integral of dq uh, will not depend only on the initial and final state. It's, we say it's not an exact differential. Okay? So that is for maybe the more exact advanced classes, which are mathematically more sophisticated. So that's the first law, right? That change in u uh, can be accounted for in two ways. Now, seems a little trivial, but it's actually very useful. Uh, and the way it's used is that because it depends only on the state, not on the path, you can tabulate it. So, of course, you have to do experiments, right? Like Joule's experiment or carry out some chemical reactions and see, keep track of heat and work and use the first law to find the change in you. And you usually start from some standard state and then maybe you measure the equation of state so you know pressure, so you can calculate the work done. So all this is, of course, a lot of hard work. So as I said, thermodynamics will not do everything for you. But once you have made these tables, now, if you want to change from some state to some other state, you know how much energy is needed. Okay. Now, how you do it is your business. So suppose you had n states. Now, if you did not know the first law of <laughs> thermodynamics, that u is a state function, you would need to do uh, n to n minus 1 by 2 experiments, right? moving from state 1 to state 2, state 1 to state 3. But now you only need to do n experiments. Okay? So the law is useful. And chemists have used it uh, very brilliantly. There are tables right, uh, of uh, various compounds and elements in all possible states. right? And therefore, even if there are some reaction which you have never done before, but you know uh, what are the starting materials, what's the final material, you know the conditions that you, you know how whether maybe you have to put in heat or maybe give out heat uh, and so on, right? So these tables are widely available. Uh, I have called it energy, but I want to quickly, before one of you catches me and goes to look up these tables, uh, the chemists use the word enthalpy. Now, this I don't know if we use it in the 12th standard physics course, but I'm absolutely sure that in the same students in the chemistry textbook will uh, see this word. There will be a reaction, and on the right-hand side, they will write delta H, which is the change in enthalpy. So is it mysterious? I mean, why, why are we introducing a new concept, enthalpy? Well, the definition is very simple. Take internal energy and add P into V. Okay? But uh, you can justify it mathematically. But again, maybe we can justify it a little more uh, physically. Right? Uh, it's nothing but energy. Okay. But remember, when you have a system at uh, constant pressure, uh, its volume may change. 
So for example, let's take the melting of ice. Okay, so I have some ice, maybe a mixture of ice and water, and it's at some pressure, okay? Now more ice melts. So the volume is going to decrease, right? So if the volume decreases, the external pressure is going to do some work on the system. Right? So you can't, so therefore, actually when you say it's 80 calories per gram to melt ice, that's not the change in the energy of one gram of ice. Uh, sorry for using CGS units. I was taught in those. But it's the change in the enthalpy. Okay, it's the enthalpy of fusion of ice. And uh, this may be a small effect, only a 12% change in volume. But when you go from uh, water to steam uh, at atmospheric pressure, well, that's a huge change in volume by about 1,000. So uh, when you, not only do you have to, uh, you know, convert the water to steam, but you have to expand the steam at atmospheric pressure. You have to do that extra work. So the 540 calories per gram, which I still remember, uh, is the change in enthalpy. The actual change in energy is a bit less. So here's the diagram uh, system, which has uh, got a weight sitting on it. And the volume will keep changing, but the pressure will remain constant because the area is constant and the weight is constant. So now it's very simple. Add the potential energy of the weight, that's mgh, divided by a and multiplied by a, which we are always allowed to do. This is the pressure and this is the change in volume. Right? This is, so that's it. So enthalpy is defined as u plus pv and so long as p is constant, uh, that's the quantity which you should be using. And it's nothing but the total energy, including the energy of the system, which maintains the pressure. Okay, so I told you that thermodynamics uh, deals with transformation of energy between various forms. It's like currency, okay? Uh, so you can ask, is the currency fully convertible? Um, certainly, I was brought up at a time when it was very easy to convert uh, dollars to rupees. I mean, anyone in the street would happily do that for you, but uh, the reverse was not possible. You, you could convert rupees to dollars. I think it's become easier. Uh, after all, I'm talking of... Uh, you know, maybe 60 years ago or something like that, right? But uh, we can ask the same question about different forms of energy. Are they freely convertible? And we know that's not true. In fact, if it were true, let's just imagine it was true, we would be living in a dream world, okay? We would not need uh, to burn coal, oil, worry about solar, wind, none of the things. What, would, what could we do? Uh, just, uh, let's say you have some water at the bottom of Job Falls. And you know, you, anything which is allowed by the first law, you can do. So take two kilograms of water next to each other and transfer some. They are of course both, let us say at 30 degrees, but you transfer some heat so that uh, the one of the kilograms becomes 29 degrees, the other becomes 31 degrees. So it's hotter, right? And I told you one degree uh, you know, on one kilogram is uh, how much it's the, a thousand calories, which you can also convert to joules, right? And that's enough energy to send the water back up the top of Job Falls. Uh, I didn't tell you what Visheshaya did or what he asked other people to do. And the picture of Job Falls, which you saw, is uh, what the tourism department does for uh, when there are a lot of tourists, they <laughs> release some water. Otherwise, the water is diverted to a power station and uh, uh, the energy is not wasted, it uh, is converted to electricity. Okay. Of course, if there's too much rain, then which is right now, uh, there's enough for the power station and for the waterfall. So if you could get the water back up to Job Falls by just exchange of heat, like I explained to you, you could then get electricity out of it for free. Or another version is you are in a ship, you don't have any, uh, yes, maybe you have a, so you take a, some uh, sea water, convert it to ice, right? Extract that energy and uh, use it to dry the ship, but not possible. This is too good to be true. So uh, what violates the first law is called perpetual motion of the first kind, right? And I'm sorry to say that, uh, of course, every country has people who try to do this. Uh, one very prominent one, uh, which I remember is uh, a person who kept saying he could make energy from vacuum. Now that is fine. I mean, he's entitled to his views. It's a democracy. But what is a little surprising is he was working for the power project of the Department of Atomic Energy in Kaiga. So people asked, and by the way, I worked for the Department of Atomic Energy in NCRA. People asked, uh, you know, but this man is you know, 
saying he can make energy from vacuum and he has built something and but his bosses said look he's a very good engineer on the project so don't disturb him and more uh, maybe a little same time many of you may be too young one gentleman in tamil nadu claimed that he could convert uh, water to petrol petrol has more energy than water right so that's a violation of the first law uh, again the sad part is that uh, maybe he convinced the minister and then and this was long ago and then the minister uh, told the dst and csir you have to call this person so they called him and of course he couldn't do it but they're not violating the first law when we uh, take water at 30 degrees and split into two halves right so if you can do this this is perpetual motion of the second kind and that's not allowed so you can see that the laws of thermodynamics are really uh, like the indian penal code right they tell you what you cannot do okay so so this is giving us a feeling that the potential energy of water at the top of joke falls has a higher quality than when it falls to the bottom and gets converted to heat and this is of course all about the uh, second law now uh, second law deserves a long lecture to itself so i will just uh, give you some highlights and uh, so there's this great engineer again uh, carno who analyzed the way that all heat engines work it's interesting that the actual heat engines were all invented uh, in england various people james watt uh, george stephenson and uh, right so on but those engines were very inefficient maybe if you burnt a certain amount of coal right which had so many joules in it uh, and that you could measure you could burn the coal you know find out the heat he used it to heat water you could find out how many joules but if you looked at the mechanical work coming out of the engine there was some 5% and gradually by various tricks people realized that they can make them more efficient okay maybe if it is giving out steam then you take it away condense it extract some of the heat but all this was you know without any fundamental theory And that fundamental theory came uh, from across the english channel from france and this is a, a basic theory of heat engines which i think all of you have been exposed to but i want you this lecture is revisiting huh? you have visited it before and he made this important distinction between reversible engines and any other engine so let's uh, look at that quickly it's also a very beautiful argument it's almost a mathematical argument maybe we should teach it very early so uh the red thing is hot uh and uh the bluish thing is cold and i realize as a person in astrophysics that this is exactly the wrong way of doing it right a red star is cool and a bluish star is hot but we will stick to the popular convention that a red is hot so uh this is a reversible engine so uh, we can run it this way you can for example extract 120 joules uh, from the hot object uh, run the carnot engine and uh, deliver 60 joules to the uh, cold end what's called the sink and the remaining 60 joules will come out as useful work you can use it to lift a weight or drive a car or something like that but because this engine is reversible we can also do it the other way right uh and all our refrigerators and air conditioners really are like this they uh so you extract uh, 60 joules from the cold side right so when you're turning your end conditioner your room is already cooler than the outside then you have to supply 60 joules right so you deliver 120 to the outside right but the cost of that is you have to supply these 60 joules of work which just got converted to incidentally you would all remember that this is the ratio of temperatures absolute temperatures in this case so this is the reversible engine incidentally this uh, if one teaches in the class one can also make the point that uh, you go to a hill station you just turn on a heater uh, whatever let's say you turn on 60 joules all the 60 joules is converted to heat but if you had uh, an air conditioner but you turned it the other way i think all of you know the outside of an air conditioner or the outside of a fridge is actually hotter right then you could actually expend 60 joules of work but get 120 joules of heat into the room so this is the correct way to heat a room right? 
And I think in many advanced countries, uh, this is what is done. Okay. Uh, and this is much more efficient because the temperature difference is not much. Okay. Anyway, that's a technical point, but one worth making in the classroom. So anyway, Carnot runs this competition between his reversible engine and any engine. Now this engine may not be reversible. Okay? So it uh, takes heat from a hot body and delivers it to a cold body. And it's also supposed to produce the same 60 joules of work. Okay? But it's more efficient. So it doesn't need 120. Right? It needs only 90, let us say. And it delivers 30 here. And it, uh, yeah. right? it's able to output 60 joules of work. So is this possible? And here is this beautiful uh, reductio ad absurdum argument uh, of Carlo saying, okay, uh, here's this uh, competitor to the reversible engine, which is more efficient. Uh, I'm going to use the 60 joules to run the Carnot engine in the reverse direction. So this whole combination is not giving you any work, right? It's just running. Hmm? But see what it's doing. Hmm? Uh, there's uh, 60 joules of heat being extracted from this cold end, right? but only 30 being deposited. So the net result is 30 is being removed from here. And of course, according to the first law, it, 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 you clearly see that 90 is being removed from here, but 120 is being given back. So what's the net result of all this? The net result is you forget all the engines. You are just transferring uh, 30 joules from the cold body to the hot body. And then Carnot said, look, this is too good to be true. And therefore, uh, the reversible engine is the best. And then, of course, this was taken up, uh, taken up by Clausius to define entropy. But the fundamental concept of entropy was already there in Carnot's work. He said, the best you can do is if Q1 over T1 is equal to Q2 over T2. Right? And that's equivalent to saying that the uh, entropy uh, removed from here is being dumped here. You cannot dump less because you cannot get rid of entropy. Right? You can increase it very easily. Right? Okay, so uh, I just thought I'd revisit this. So the question mark says, can this happen? And the answer is no. Now, <laughs> I want to go in the reverse direction. There is actually a zero flaw, which, see, I have been using the concepts like equilibrium, temperature, and so on. But uh, should we be taking it for granted? So if you want to, I, I'm not sure whether textbooks do this, but certainly, you know, advanced students, uh, teachers, of course, and undergraduate, postgraduate. I'm, I'm sure textbooks have it because uh, everything that I learned in my undergraduate is now there in the 12th standard. Okay. So how do we know there is something called temperature? So if you want to, uh, if you read some books on uh, thermodynamics, they are like by Callan, they are almost written like books on geometry. They would have axioms. So one of the axioms would be that if you have two bodies, you put them into contact, and they will reach equilibrium by exchanging energy. And once they reach equilibrium, they stay in equilibrium. So that's an assumption, that's an axiom. And that way you're assuming the second law, that the heat will flow from the hotter body to the colder body. Okay. But then there's also this nice mathematical idea that if A is equilibrium with B, and A is also in equilibrium with C, we don't have to separately test whether B is in equilibrium with C. Okay. Both have the same temperature. So A is like the thermometer. Okay. But a thermometer, uh, yes, you can measure some property of A. If it's a liquid, you can measure how much it expands, right? But there's no guarantee that different thermometers will uh, give you the same readings, right? So to start with, thermometers are somewhat arbitrary. It's true that most liquids expand in somewhat the same way. So once you have fixed uh, ice and uh, steam, or in the case of Fahrenheit, <laughs> you, have, you don't even fix ice, uh, I don't know where he got his uh, lower point from. I think it's something to do with seawater, salt water. Anyway, uh, there's no real guarantee. Even if I fix an alcohol and a uh, mercury thermometer to work, either of them can be used to test whether two bodies are in equilibrium. So at this stage, temperature is some arbitrary number, but you should be consistent. Now, um, but today we talk of absolute temperature, ideal gas temperature, right? And uh, maybe I'll, I'll also mention that this is a somewhat abstract idea because in our normal 
laboratory, we never cooled down things this much. So I was very happy that when I was teaching a course on Tamil physics, sharing it with one of my colleagues, who is a much better experimenter than me. And she said, look, we can demonstrate it to these uh, students. She came up with something very simple. Uh, and I'm, maybe it's there in a standard. But I wish I had it in my own undergraduate. Of course, in undergraduate, you believe everything that the textbook tells you. Right? But uh, so it had a flask and uh, had a simple rubber tube and maybe a liquid level. So you could see how much the volume changed. right? And then you just put it in cold water, room temperature and hot water. So plot the volume at three temperatures and just extrapolate it back. And this simple experiment already gives you minus 250 to minus 300. Right? So you, you don't have to do anything very elaborate. So ideal gas came, but even more fundamental, suppose there had been no ideal gases. Uh, then the only way to define temperature would have been to run a Carnot engine, measure Q1 by Q2, and say that is the ratio T1 by T. Uh, so Carnot used ideal gas in his argument. So the ideal gas scale agrees with. But the most fundamental way of looking at temperature is, it's actually not as fundamental as entropy, which is a, it comes as a bit of a shock. Uh, so, you have to run these heat engines, measure Q1 and Q2, and that's how you will find out. Uh, okay, uh, okay, we have we went backwards. Yes, uh, PowerPoint is reversible. Yeah. So that's a little bit of the history. So in fact, if you ask what is the most axiomatic form of uh, thermodynamics, huh? definitely, uh, in fact, I would say it should not be taught even at MSc level. But you know, you'll always have a few students who, are, who uh, may be very mathematically minded or so on. So then in that form of thermodynamics, temperature is defined in a very interesting way. Entropy is defined first. Uh, I mean, you have dq. And then you say, uh, if you do uh, dq reversibly, then T is that quantity, which if you divide dQ by T, it becomes a state function. <laughs> now, how is that? So this definition was given by a mathematician called Carothiodori. Okay. So this is just to tell you that our humble Q1 by T1 equals Q2 by T2 can be taken to a great height and be used to define temperature. But I think for practical purposes, ideal gas temperature is fine. So what is this entropy, right? Which uh, is all about irreversibility. Right? Uh, one can debate whether it's randomness or disorder or ignorance and so on. Uh, but I would say at an introductory level, I would say it has something to do with mixing or shuffling. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, you can have heat energy uh, distributed non-uniformly and then it goes to a uniform distribution. Right? You can have a concentration of sugar or salt being more in one part and it becomes more uniform by diffusion. Now, what is really interesting is uh, there is a law called Fick's law, which tells you uh, that the salt will go from the region of higher concentration to the region of lower concentration. So does the salt molecule know <laughs> which direction is higher concentration and which direction is lower concentration? And the answer is absolutely not. Okay, It doesn't know. Each salt molecule does exactly what it likes. It moves to the left, to the right, up, down, because it's being randomly hit. The real reason is that uh, the uniform state has a greater probability, even though the individual uh, things are random. Now, this should not be that shocking. Uh, if you toss a coin 100 times, uh, you know, you could have 100 heads, or you could have, uh, and that's a very unique configuration, or you could have 100 heads, uh, 50 heads and 50 tails, and that's not a unique configuration because where exactly these 50 heads and tails occur is still one degree of freedom. And you'll have a very large number, like factorial 100 by factorial 50 whole squared. Right? So it's not that an individual state with 50 heads is preferred. Okay? But so we're really cheating when we use the word state. Right? We say there's a uniform state and there's a non-uniform state. But each one of these is actually many, many states. So you have to count. You know. And whichever state has the greater count has the greater probability. And even though uh, the individual molecules don't know anything, uh, the system tends to this. Now, there's one case where you can actually see this uh, very easily. Okay. So, yes, I think I do have time. 
So this is uh, an example. You can either think of it as a gas, which occupies one half of a container. And for the moment, let's say this hole is closed. OK? Or you can think of it as a liquid. And then these are molecules of some solute. Right? And uh, this is the solution. And this side is pure water. Okay? And uh, what the increase of entropy or second law and common experience tell us is that uh, this is the state, the equilibrium state, uniform concentration. Actually, you could even think of these as phonons and then it becomes uniform temperature. Okay, but anyway. So this is the direction that we see in nature. Do we see this? Uh, and the answer would seem to be no. Right? We don't see this. But you can also see that this answer depends very much on the fact that the number of molecules is very large. Okay? So if you toss a coin four times, you will get four heads. Uh, I mean, with a, maybe not in the first experiment, but if you do it uh, 30, 40 times, you definitely very likely get four heads. Okay? So the configurations which uh, the second law of thermodynamics tells you uh, are impossible are not actually impossible. They are rare, but if the number of molecules is uh, the Avogadro number, then rare is the same as impossible. Okay? So, uh, so again, you can mathematically count this, but even uh, counting this is not fully convincing. So uh, when there was no pandemic and we were in our temporary campus, I was teaching this subject. So I, I took the students out. Anyway, they get very impatient when they're sitting in the classroom. Right? I said, okay, so now uh, I'm going to put all of you on one side of some line. One of the students had to be a volunteer to write down all their names on this slips of paper uh, and uh, put them in a box. And then he would pull out a name and call it. So that person had to move from whichever side they were to the opposite side, okay? So that is the rule. And that more or less imitates the random behavior of molecules. Molecules on this side, it might stay there or it might move to the other side. So on this side, it may be able to move to this side. So there's no irreversibility as far as one molecule is concerned, all right? So initially, of course, all the people were on this side. So whichever name he called out, moved to the other side. But as a few people accumulated here, Occasionally, he, by the way, he replaced the pieces of paper. Okay, that's important. Because, you know, a molecule doesn't die when it comes to this side. It's still free to move. So when students played this game, they quickly realized that uh, they'll get an equal con configuration. Of course, the number is, I don't have an Avogadro's number of students, but about 15 and 15. But once you're at 15 and 15, it doesn't stop there. Every now and then, a person will go to this side, it'll become unbalanced. But then the moment you have a larger number here, it becomes more likely that this student's name will be called and the numbers tend to equalize. So this is, uh, I think, the simplest way that you can justify to uh, curious students uh, how the second law works, right? But also that when you deal with very small systems, it doesn't work. So you, are, you, have, uh, you have what are called fluctuations. Okay? So you shouldn't take the second law literally. Right? and say it's going to become uniform. It will become tend to be uniform, but then it will fluctuate. Now, as I said, this could be a, a whole topic in itself. So that's why I put the word usually. <laughs> so there is no contradiction between what you learn in mechanics. In mechanics, if two particles collide from some initial velocities and go to some final velocities, you can also give it the, you can reverse them. You have the two final velocities go back to the initial. A planet going around the sun, you reverse its velocity, you go around the sun in the opposite direction. Okay. But you can't say that the, you know, the laws of mechanics suddenly become irreversible just because I have Avogadro's number of particles. Right? And that paradox is resolved by the argument that I just gave you uh, about uh, the number of states. Which, and of course, if your students are still not convinced, uh, you know, uh, this is something that their mothers uh, would know very well, that they, uh, you know, uh, they take a lot of trouble and arrange uh, the room or maybe the student's hostel room very nicely. And then <laughs> very quickly things get scattered around. And it's very easy to scatter them around. It takes a lot of effort to get them back into an orderly state. 
because there are many, many more ways of creating a scattered room than of having an orderly room. Okay. So now let me uh, summarize the laws. Okay. Uh, as I said, these laws are really prohibitions, right? You cannot, like the Ten Commandments. Of course, there it, in the Bible it says, "Thou shalt not." Right? So, "Thou shalt not get energy from nowhere." Okay, that's the first law. And uh, somewhere, someone decided to condense it even further and said, "You cannot win." Okay? That's the absence of perpetual motion of the first kind. Then, the next prohibition is. You cannot exchange heat for work with 100% efficiency. So the concise form of that is, you will always lose something. You cannot win, you will always lose. Now there's a small exception to this. Uh, if you take uh, the formula Q1 by T1 equals Q2 by T2, Q2 is what you lose, right? But suppose T2 was zero, right? Then, Entire Q1 could be converted, but there is a third law, which we don't talk about that much, but it says that absolute zero uh, cannot be attained. Okay? This again deserves a lengthy discussion by itself. Right? So even this loophole in the second law is plugged by the third law. So uh, the way that this, uh, you know, this uh, person summarized it is, you cannot win, you will always lose something, but you also cannot quit the game by going to absolute zero. So uh, this is a well-known thing. You will find it on the internet. But I thought for this lecture, I should also give uh, some place to the zeroth law. So my candidate for the zeroth law is there is a game. <laughs> Without the zeroth law, there would be no concept of equilibrium, no concept of temperature, and so on. Right? So uh, let me uh, stop here. Right? And, uh, yeah, in nearly 12, and perhaps a bit shorter than what you thought, but that actually gives more time for more discussion. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. I would like to thank yes, you personally for sparing your valuable time and enlightening our audience with the informative lecture. Now, I, uh, I want to inform all the audience that the session is open for questions. And I would like to request Dr. Yogesh Kumar to conduct the uh, question session. Over to you, Yogesh, sir. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, sir, for this wonderful lecture. And this lecture was full of new facts and carry a lot of uh, interesting information uh, related to this uh, uh, law of thermodynamics. So, uh, I can see a lot of queries from the participants, so quickly I can take uh, some of questions from the participants now. Uh, first question is from uh, Vishwanath Bharti. Why the convention of work done by the gas and work done on the gas opposite in physics and chemistry? Uh, uh, okay, one minute. Let me, uh, okay, this one I don't need to go back to my presentation, but uh, let me go back anyway. Uh, I think you have yourself answered the question. It's a convention, right? And it's unfortunate. Uh, so uh, I don't want to blame thermodynamics people because the convention for right circular and left circular in optics uh, is actually uh, different. Mm -hmm. I think the optics people have one convention and the people who work with electromagnetic waves, radio waves have another convention. So uh, so I, in, in fact, I was not aware that See, I, I think uh, it's not really a convention. It's more that you're talking of two different quantities. Right? I think everyone would agree that if A does work on B, that is, if F, F is uh, the force exerted by A on B, and uh, you know DL is the displacement of the point of application of that force, F dot DL is the work done, everyone would agree that uh, energy is transferred. So I think, I, I think uh, somewhere in that chemistry textbook, they will say that uh, we will talk of work done uh, by the system or work done on the system. Now PDV, which is our favorite, right, 
is actually work done by the system. Right? If dV is positive and p is positive, the system is expanding uh, against the pressure. So it actually, or in my diagram, it has to lift the weight. So it's actually work done, uh, and the system itself loses energy. So it's maybe not a, so much a change in convention as a change in the quantity one is talking about. Uh, so next question is from uh, Prakash Yadav. Hmm. Any law of thermodynamics is violated at the molecular level or in nanoscale level? Why all the pr properties of thermodynamics potential changes at the nanoscale metal level? Um, okay, this is actually a, a quite a, a subtle point. Uh, as I told you, the laws as we normally state them refer to average properties. Okay. So even at the nanoscale, you might find a system fluctuating and appearing to cool down. But then the law again becomes true if you look at a large collection of the nanoscale systems. And then you will find that overall the law is. And this is important because otherwise you would think that, yes, I will construct perpetual motion machines by using uh, nanoscale objects. But if you have a collection of nanoscale objects, a large number of them, that again uh, obeys the laws of thermodynamics. So in fact, uh, this is again, and normally when we all thought, after all, I started studies in the 1960s, right? So we thought thermodynamics is a dead subject, right? With all these laws. Uh, of course, there are some laws of irreversible processes and so on. But in 1990s and early 20th century, some new laws, were proposed. I didn't talk about them. They are called fluctuation theorems. So uh, let me give an example of a fluctuation theorem because it may answer your doubt a little bit. Uh, so uh, let us say that uh, the normal law says that the work done is the change in free energy. But for a nanoscale system, that is not true. However, uh, the fluctuation theorem still tells you that if you do it for a large number of experiments, it will relate some function of W to some function of delta F. So this is the way uh, the laws are still useful in the nanoscale. Huh? Right. Well, that was a very good question. And maybe if someone, you, if you just Google fluctuation theorems, you can learn more about this. Huh? And all this is uh, very fairly recent. Given that thermodynamics is hundreds of years old, uh, some of these things were only realized in the late 19th and late 20th and early 21st century. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question is from Yash Dahima. Uh, first question uh, is, what is the relationship between the change of entropy and arrow of time? And another question is, what is the significance of this relationship? Um, okay, this is a, a somewhat <laughs> a philosophical question. Many people have written about this. That there is a concept of arrow of time. We all think that we know uh, time is increasing, right? And time doesn't flow in the reverse direction. Whereas the laws of physics do not seem to distinguish between t and minus t. So if you look at Newton's laws, for example, it has some d square x by dt square. So instead of x of t, if you write x of minus t, it'll still satisfy that. Of course, some forces depend on velocity, but all that can be taken care of. So it looks like the laws do not seem to single out a direction of time. So people who worry about fundamentals uh, talk of an arrow of time and then say maybe. Uh, so then this is not in the laws themselves. Right? As I told you, uh, the increase of entropy doesn't tell you that uh, the laws of mechanics are wrong. But so people say this may have something to do with the initial condition. So maybe the universe was very orderly to start with and then is gradually becoming more and more disordered. So the arrow of time is really, uh, so you give me two pictures of the universe and you can ask me which one is comes first and which one comes second. Hmm? Why don't you get the whole movie? And someone may have even interchanged the two pictures. So this idea is that I will uh, calculate the entropy in both the pictures and whichever one has the greater entropy, I will say that came at a later time. So that's my understanding of this uh, statement. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question is from Joseph. Can we define temperature for single molecule or particle? Uh, okay, a simple answer is no. <laughs> yeah. 
you can it's it's a mechanical system you can define its uh, energy so i would also say you do why do you need the concept of temperature for a single point <laughs> see the whole concept of temperature came when we put large bodies in contact with each other and then we needed some property of the body which would predict will heat flow from this body to that body or that body to this body and that's how the concept of temperature uh, entered into physics okay if you're dealing with uh, single particles yes it may encounter another particle but then newton's laws will tell you what will happen so i would say the concept uh, it, the concept is inapplicable and also unnecessary however uh, this is not a full answer then you will tell me okay what about two particles three particles four particles so it becomes related to the previous question right when at what stage does the concept of temperature really start applying so formally you could probably as i told you this there's a literature on fluctuation theorems uh, you know thermodynamics of small systems and so on and uh, they will give you formal definitions which will be valid for any value of n so i would say those definitions become useful uh, as n becomes larger and larger so yes i, I so again you know uh, either maybe not now but if uh, anyone is interested in following this up i could send some reference okay sir uh, next question is from uh, devendra goswami if the second law is statistical law then whenever it violates then how it affect the nature mm -hmm. so rather than talk of violation i would say that the second law assigns entropy to various uh, macroscopic states of the system right uh, then it makes a general statement that you will go from this state to that state but not in the reverse direction right now if you look very closely at the system then you find it's not strictly in that final state it keeps fluctuating so for example in in the example of the two halves of a gas uh, in a box right uh, we say on the average the numbers are equal but it fluctuates so i would say that uh, the second law especially when it's understood in the context of uh, you know a statistical exactly what you said is a statement about the average behavior of a large number of systems and but it can also if you go a little beyond second law and look at uh, okay let me give let me give you a, and this is an interesting part of history the boltzmann wrote down this famous formula s is equal to k log w okay uh, where w is the number of microstates now it actually einstein and this is a contribution of einstein which not many people know because later on he went into relativity quantum theory and so on but when he was very young and writing his phd thesis he said look i'm going to read this equation the other way w is equal to exponential of s divided by k so all possible uh, if a state has a lower value of s it has a lower value of w doesn't mean it won't exist it will actually uh, occur a smaller number of times so einstein actually calculated fluctuations by reading boltzmann's formula in the reverse direction and he wrote his phd thesis on brownian motion based on that so i hope that answers the spirit of your uh, question that uh, the deeper way of understanding uh, second law is it's a connection between probability and entropy i mean that's boltzmann's way i i didn't go into the statistical aspect very much but since there's a lot of interest i'm happy to answer questions about it Uh, so next question is from uh, Partha Goswami. Uh, from quantum perspective, the loss of information is synonymous with increase in entropy. The master equation involves repeated transformation of an initial pure state to a mixed state, which is non-unitary projections occurring during evolution. So, second law seems to have its roots in it. in the non unitary projection occurring during the evolution do you agree okay i'm i'm not an expert on master equations and uh, projections and so on but what i understand the physics of this question is that these master equations or non unitary evolutions describe what are called open systems right it's a system in contact with some uh, what they call bath okay or reservoir or something like that uh So yes, I think these descriptions of open systems are important, and I would certainly I agree with them. They have been done by very wise men. But if you're looking at issues of principle, right? Uh, these uh, results theorems are proved, assuming a very specific initial condition for the bath, 
So system plus bath is a closed system. Now in reality, uh, so this is only a model. Your real system in your laboratory is, is it's not that you prepare the bath in a specific state. Whereas I'm 100% sure that, well, either people will prepare that bath itself in some Tamil state, in which case your argument is circular. You're assuming Tamil dynamics, or you may prepare the bath in some very specific state, ground state or something. So anyway, the, all this is really uh, you know, PhD or higher level. So, so again, I'd be happy to, uh, but I'm not an expert. So I could, in this case, if someone wrote to me, I would divert that email to some of my friends who are very good at this. <laughs> Say Thank Arun, Arun Jainavar at the in, in Institute of Physics, for example. Yeah. He, he's an expert on nanoscale fluctuation theorems. So I've, I've already mentioned his name. You can easily find him. Arun uh, Jainavar. Okay, so next question is uh, S is equal K log W. Basically, for the logarithm function, the slope is increasing slowly as W increases. Why S increases slowly for larger W? How to understand physically? Okay. Mm. Uh, thanks, Amitabha, for your note in the chat. Yeah. I enjoyed it very much. I enjoyed it very much. So, uh, well, I will, I will uh, twist the question a little more. Rather than slope, I would say, what is special about logarithm, right? Hmm? And uh, the answer seems to be that uh, actually, can I, can I share a slide? I, I, it's from another lecture. I almost wanted to put that slide into this lecture, but I did not. But uh, and I did not set up this question so that someone else could. Uh, uh, if you don't mind, I, I will do that. Huh? It'll just take me a few minutes. No, no, I don't want to leave the meeting. Let me uh, share the screen. Mm, yeah. Let me go to. Uh, no, I'll share the screen. Share it. Yeah. Now. No, this is not the one I want. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll uh, I won't spend too much online time. The uh, log W acquires a lot of significance. You think of W as your measure of uh, the number of possible states, your ignorance, okay? So I don't know. Uh, if you ask me uh, which state is the system in, my answer is it could be in any one of these W states. Hmm? I don't know and also I don't care because they all have very similar properties, okay? Most of them, the vast majority of them will have, just like the vast majority of coin tosses will have 50% heads, 50% tails with some uh, variation, okay? Now suppose I have two independent systems. Then I have W1 states for the first one, W2 states for the second one, okay? So the W for the combined system is W1 multiplied by W2. Now we could have stopped there actually, right? but it's very inconvenient to have a property which you have to multiply if you put two systems together. So that was the genius of Boltzmann that he took logarithm. So then entropy became an additive function. So that's, that's and you will see that only logarithm will do the job, actually. So I hope uh, that helps. That uh, the multiplicative property of W for independent systems leads to, uh, uh, the, you define entropy in such a way that it's additive. And of course, why did Boltzmann do that? Because he was not the first person to define entropy. It was defined by Clausius. And the way Clausius defined it, it was obviously additive, right? You had two separate boxes, you added heat to one, divided by the temperature, same thing in the other box. So that's the uh, that's my understanding of why you need this uh, logarithm. And by the way, it didn't stop with Boltzmann. In information theory and so on, the same log W is used. Again, uh, you know, beyond the scope of this lecture, yeah. Uh, so next question is from uh, Joseph. How to understand negative temperature in terms of law of thermodynamics in a case of um, spin degree of freedom? Okay. Now, uh, okay. So again, this will take me a little bit beyond the current scope. Let me see if I can... Okay, I'm trying to use this uh, board. So there is this formula 
which says that uh, i'm sorry my writing will not be very good you have a probability of uh, finding a system in a state e is given by this formula right boltzmann's other formula now it can beta be negative that's really the question because beta is 1 by k now that means this will become an increasing function of e so states with higher energy will be more probable will be more likely to be found in states with lower energy now but all the probability should add up to 1 right so this is a very uh, so if you take a system like a gas in a box there's no upper limit to the energy okay so there's no upper limit to the energy then this is absurd because uh, you cannot add up all these it will be a divergent series right however suppose the number of values of e is finite like suppose system has only two levels you have a, a proton it's in a magnetic field it can magnetic moment can either point anti parallel or parallel to the magnetic field one state has a higher energy one state has lower energy. then there's no difficulty uh, if the lower energy state is more populated this is temperature is positive if the high energy state is more populated the temperature is negative now such systems became experimentally accessible in the 1950s with the advent of nuclear magnetic resonance so the first papers on negative absolute temperature actually started appearing around that time and then people started assuming that you have these restricted systems which have a finite number of energy levels then you can uh, extend uh, the laws of thermodynamics to uh, uh, this so for example one of the curious uh, features of this would be uh, ds is equal to dq divided by t suppose t is negative it means if i supply energy to the system in the form of dq entropy goes down hmm? so is that possible uh, yes it is because i have uh, a lower level and i have an upper level Okay. okay. Now, suppose I go on supplying energy, then everything will go to the upper level. Of course, then I can't supply any more energy. But this is a state with very low entropy. No? Everything is sitting in one state. So, so uh, answer is yes. A negative temperature is a useful concept, but for this very restricted class of systems, where there is an upper limit to the energy that the system can accept. Okay. Uh... so there is a long list of the questions and uh, due to paucity of time uh, i can take only two or three more questions uh, now next question is from uh, devinder goswami as microscopically second law is a statistical law wherever it violates then how to it affect the nature i think i actually answered this question uh, because the name was familiar with the question was also familiar you can ask uh, yeah so the next question is from anuradha mathur if two dissimilar sized bodies at the same temperature are in contact is there any heat exchange between them uh oh, yes <laughs> simple answer is yes uh, when i uh, buy, you know in pandemic you know we were afraid of food so we bought all these ready made you know palak paneer which comes in a small packet and then i put it into boiling water and open it so these are two differently sized body and uh, they come to equilibrium and uh, in fact i want to i want to uh, take the opportunity uh, is it the same anuradha mathur whom i met many many years ago in ncrt in uh, textbook workshop uh, at that uh, time maybe you were in bhopal or something like that i mean it's, 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 it, it could be someone else with the same name but i just thought i would ask okay so this is the last question uh, hmm. i can read here uh, from the rupini can there be an additional energy term when we observe an invalidity of the first law for a specific system say in the case of quantum heat energy okay <coughs> <coughs> sorry <coughs> so there's a very interesting history uh, which exactly what you said happened so in 1930s uh, of course for radioactivity was discovered early in the century and they found that uh, when a nucleus decays say it produces alpha particles and so on and they deposit their energy right uh, and they could account for it thermodynamically they could measure the heat and see but when uh, something emitted beta particles electrons they found that they could not account for the energy okay and a great physicist niels bohr 
for 10 years of his life, he said, let us give up the law of conservation of energy. Okay. From say 1920 to 1930, roughly. <laughs> of course, other people said no. <laughs> Finally, the law of conservation of energy was saved because in 1930s, uh, Pauli, Wolfgang Pauli, another great physicist, uh, said, look, you are missing this much of energy because there's another particle called neutrino, which is carrying away the energy. And the neutrino is not depositing heat because maybe it has a very small cross section it's going away. Now, uh, this is, uh, of course, that was only a theory. But in 1950s, in fact, Pauli himself said that, you know, it may be very difficult to detect this particle. Whoever detects it, I will send them so much of wine or something like that. And in 1950s, uh, uh, Rhinus uh, and Cohen measured, they uh, were actually able to detect these neutrinos. So today we know that even at the quantum level of individual particles, uh, and now every time there is missing energy, uh, people try to account for it in terms of other particles which carry it. But sooner or later, they will have to look for other evidence of those particles. Yeah. So my simple answer is no. Even in quantum mechanics, we would like to use conservation of energy. Okay, uh, thank you so much, sir, for handling the queries of the participants and sharing the very useful information. Uh, in case participants have uh, more queries, then they can directly mail to uh, Professor Rajaram, sir. Uh, uh, if, sir, you permit. Yes. To, uh, share it, the it's, it's already shared, I think. Okay. But, <laughs> yeah, anyway, you can okay. share it again. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Poonam Jain for further proceeding. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Before proceeding further, there are a few announcements for the participants that the attendance link is shared in the chat box and it will remain open till 2 p.m. Secondly, we have our next lecture in this series on 10th of July by well-known Professor Venkat Raman Balakrishnan. He is from IIT Madras. He is going to speak on the title, Hidden Symmetry in Planetary Motions. Those who have missed our earlier lectures conducted in the first series in 2020 can view them on the IAPT RC1 YouTube channel. Kindly uh, subscribe this channel so that you will have the notification in the future as well. Now, I would like to request Dr. Seema Wirtz, the Executive Council member Indian Association Physics Teachers Regional Council 1 to propose vote of thanks. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Poonam. Uh, honorable speakers, Professor Raja Ram Nityanan, Ajim Premji University, Bengaluru, respected Professor Amitva Ray Chaudhary, Calcutta University, our most valued invited guests and participants. It's my proud privilege to have been asked by our respected president, uh, Poonam, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, you are absolutely audible. Okay, fine. Uh, it's my proud privilege to have been asked by our respected president, Professor V.P. Srivastava, to propose the vote of thanks on this occasion of launching the uh, lecture series with the on, uh, inaugural lecture being delivered by uh, none other than the most revered personality in academic sphere, Professor Raja Ram Nityanand. On behalf of IAPT RC, Delhi and Haryana, I convey my gratitude and heartfelt thanks to Professor Raja Ram Dityanand for accepting our invitation and consenting to deliver the online lecture today. Sir's erudite presentation has truly set the benchmark for a series of resourceful and illuminating discourses uh, in this event. In addition, our physics teachers and researchers have a sense of direction and much food for the thought. Now they can interpret energy as a currency and you as a bank account balance and certainly W and Q as a transaction. So he has added a new dimension to laws of thermodynamics. Once again, sir, sincere thanks to you for touching upon the various aspects of thermodynamics and igniting our minds. I express my gratitude to Professor Amitwa Ray Chaudhary, Calcutta University, Dr. P. N. Vashni, teachers of Delhi University uh, Science Forum, teachers of Delhi, uh, physics teachers of Delhi University, all the school principals and another uh, invited guests for their esteemed presence amongst us. An event like this, 
cannot happen overnight. It requires planning and uh, bird's eye view uh, details. We have been asked, uh, backed by a webinar technical team of very matriculated and dedicated teachers, Dr. R.K. Tiwari, Dr. M.S. Vandari, Dr. S.K. Singhal, Puram Jain, and Yugesh Kumar, who have worked day and night under the supervision of our esteemed president, Professor V.P. Srivastava, to organize this mm -hmm. event. We are deeply indebted to our president and other members of committee, Dr. O.P. Sharma, Dr. Ravi Bhattacharya, and Professor H.K. Shezwani for their painstaking trouble in identifying the most appropriate distinguished personality like Professor Raja Ram Nityanand and extending the inter, uh, invitation for this online lecture series. Today's lecture is the testimony to their splendid efforts and accordingly, it's a privilege to thank you all. Last but not the least, we uh, remain obliged to our whole team of IAPT RC1, Dr. Giri Bhardwaj, Dr. Rajiv Tyagi, Ms. Vandana Banga, Dr. Manoj Koshik, Mrs. Ramni Kapoor, uh, Dr. Ajay Kumar, Dr. Prem Singh, Dr. Vikas Mittal, Dr. Manoj Tiwari, and Dr. Rakesh Kumar, who are the backbone of this organization. I express my deep sense of thanks and appreciation to all the participants who sp uh, spared their valuable time to be with us this morning. A special thanks goes to all the dignitaries in the audience to spare their valuable time. Thank you all once again. Over to you, Poonam, now. Thank you so much, ma'am. Today's event, a marvelous success has approached its end. Before we let you leave, I request everyone to kindly turn on their cameras for a few snapshots so that we can relish this moment. We appreciate everyone's present virtually in the event. I request Yogesh sir to take some snapshots. With this, we hope we will see you all soon next week with great enthusiasm. Till then, stay home, stay safe, a goodbye. Thank you all. Thank you. <clears throat> Sir, if you permit, may I uh, end uh, formally? Yeah, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat>